All righty, so we're gonna get started here and if others join, that's great. Um, thank you all of you for joining. My name is Daniela Lowenberg. I work at the California Digital Library and I'm the project lead for Make Data Count. On the phone, we also have Christian Garza, a developer at Datasite, as well as Matt Jones, technical director for Data One. Uh, in addition, we have Rushi Raj on the line as well, who worked on the Data One side of this project, and Amber Boudin, of course. So thank you all for joining, and we're going to go through the agenda here. So uh, it's a little hard when it's a webinar and we can't ask for a raise of hands of who here has heard of Make Data Count, but uh, we're actually only going to do a really brief intro on the project. And so I want to direct people to all of our, our webinars that are on our website, makedatacount. Uh, dot com so that you can actually see the uh, all the webinars that we have on implementation the background of the project all of the different components and we're just going to do a brief bit here opening it up then i'm going to pass it over to christian and matt who are going to show us the magic of shared infrastructure and show some of these demos uh, that we're really excited that are just being released we're going to talk about what's next and how we all can collaboratively make data count and uh, if you type your questions into the chat box at the end, we'll have time for those and we'll be able to moderate that. Next slide. So we always like to start off with this unicorn and say, imagine a world where data are considered a first class research output and are valued as such. We do not believe that we're in that state right now and make data count was set out to achieve this goal through building the infrastructure to get us there. Next slide. So a brief history on make data count. Next slide. In 2014, uh, PLOS, CDL, and Data One uh, worked together on an NSF eager grant that was called Making Data Count. And the big output of this project was investigating and finding what researchers valued in data metrics. And so because of this, uh, we found that they really cared about views, downloads, and citations. And that was something that we really wanted to build off of. Next slide. Following that, the Moore Foundation uh, was able to give a meeting grant for CDL, Data Site, and Data One to come together and think about what would a phase of a project look like that's building off of what we found out in the survey, um, what researchers value, and how we could eventually get to the point of having data metrics. Next slide. Which brings us here to our project now. So the Sloan Foundation funded a two-year project for us between Data Site, Data One, and CDL. We've also been working with Project Counter to write a code of practice. And the project has been focused on building the infrastructure and driving the adoption of research data metrics. And so again, I wanna point people back a little bit to former presentations that we've done that go into this in a little more detail, but at a high level, I'll show you know, what the project was focused on doing. Next slide. So we put together this diagram. Next slide. And the, the first part of this is really the standardizing. So I said that we worked with Project Counter. Uh, they have been known to write uh, these counter reports that if you're in the library or at publishers, you may be familiar with. And what we really wanted was to have a way that we could compare views and downloads and all other, um, and these metrics that are coming in when people are accessing the data at a repository level. And so what we did is we worked with Counter to develop this recommendation. Counter has now published that. It's called the Counter Code of Practice for Research Data. It's on the Counter website and you can also find it on ours as well. And that's actually this bit of taking our logs and standardizing it against this code of practice so we can have a comparable measurement across these. And this is this whole standardizing and log processing portion of the project. Next slide. The second part about it is contributing. So we're working with Crossref and data site event data, and that's what we're calling this data level metrics hub. The picture here actually had changed a bit since we had originally put this display out when we realized that really what we're using is the Crossref and data site event data infrastructure. And that's where we wanna be feeding all of these logs that we're processing. And so the point of today's webinar is actually for Christian and Matt to show what happens when people are contributing to the central infrastructure and what we can do. 
Next slide. And the last part of that is displaying. So at a repository level, being, act being able to show these comparable views, downloads, um, the aggregations of it, the citations. Of course, I didn't highlight at the top there the citations. Um, this is through leveraging other things like Crossref and Datacite and Scholix um, and trying to feed citations into this event data infrastructure as well to display it back. So. Um, if you look back uh, to find our past webinars, we had an awesome one last month with Zenodo, Dataverse, and Dryad, where they show kind of how they're displaying, and we talked through that. Um, and so there's a lot of resources on that if you're interested. Next slide. And I'm going to pass it over to Christian. Thank you, Daniela. So as Daniela mentioned already, um, in, the uh, in the beginning, a core part of the Make the Account project is to provide um, this shared infrastructure to publish data usage and citation. Um, the main component of that shared infrastructure is the event data service. Um, next slide, yeah. And this is a service uh, between data site and Crossref event data, is a service that provides connections between persistent identifiers and other sources with an initial focus on social media uh, mentions and data citations. However, in the Make the Account project, we expect repositories, user data repositories, to use event data to both report usage and as well to a centralized place and an open place, and also to consume data usage and citations from the same, from the same resource. There are many advantages uh, about this shared infrastructure. I mean, it eliminates silos by improving the flow of information, also reduces complexity by providing a single place to retrieve usage and citations. Uh, it also eliminates work for repositories, as it provides different features that we think are useful for the community at large. A very, uh, and that particular, that's, this feature is what we want to discuss in the next section. Can, can we do the next slide? Yeah. Um, these new features are, were not in event data before. They, they are believed of, I believe these features, which is mostly about aggregation for consuming usage and citations are the utmost importance. On one side, they expose the main advantage to having this centralized open share infrastructure. In the other one, they address some of the most complex use cases about consuming usage and data citations. Next slide. I think we are all familiar with a simple case that will be you consuming usage and citations from a specific data set. And this is done thanks to the DOI designed to those data sets. Next slide. This is an example from the data chat, the Dash repository. You can see on the, on the right side of the screen, you have a usage display there with views and downloads for that specific data set. The same data set could be seen in other interfaces. Next slide. Um, this is the same data set, but in the data set search interface in which you can see the same usage and downloads, but also the distribution over time of how they are, are coming in into the system. Um, However, this is a simple case, and I think in order to, pro, uh, to show the potential of using this central infrastructure, we, we can look at more complex cases. The actors in these more complex cases are sometimes disconnected by more than one degree of separation. And in the past, one will, uh, a consumer will need to uh, execute a different steps in order to answer a question. Uh, in order to answer those use cases. So I want to show you now how using event data, we can address those ones. And I'm going to show you only three use cases. The first one is about data centers. So next slide. So data centers are in essence, a collection of data sets. They register the UI metadata, but in many cases they are completely separated from the entity that collects usage and citation data. Uh, in event data, one can identify data centers by uh, registering registr an ID. And this ID in place uh, is connected to data sets, which are linked to use usage stats and citation stats. So we have two degrees of separation there. Using this registering ID, one can ask questions such as how many citations or usage does a data center have? And obtain all these citations and data usage stats associated with that data center and all these data sets. And this question is obviously important for data centers to aggregate all their usage and citation counts. Next slide. There are other cases, for example, related to funders. Uh, funders would like to be able to get indicators of the impact of their grants, as well as which 
specific individuals benefited from these grants. Funders are already persistently identified with Crossref cross funders IDs, and these IDs and all the events around these IDs live in event data. Uh, funder IDs uh, are connected to datasets, and these datasets are connected in place to cited work, like journal articles. Again, two degrees of separation there. And by nature of using PIDs, we get the possibility of ask complex questions, a new set of questions. And these are questions that I might not ask, these questions that you might not ask, but someone might ask what data sets funded by the European Commission have been cited by a journal article. Uh, next slide. And in this example, uh, the cross, we use the cross ref funder ID for the European Commission, inquiry all the instances in which a data set was linked by a funder ID, but also was cited by a journal article. And every single hit that you when you get for actually querying that endpoint will be a data set that has been funded and has been cited at the same time. It's worth mentioning that dependent data service role re response with JSON response, and we have actually format that in a way that you can do something useful with that. In this case, it's visualize that response in a graph. Um, and here you can see how the funder ID on the on the website uh, sits in the middle of this graphical representation of that JSON response. And one example that I put there is about this journal article from, from the Frontiers in Neuroinformatics that is citing a data set in the Senate repository, which in place was funded by the European Commission. I want to stress that this is early work uh, and these 14 citations that you get there are not the only data sets that have been funded by the European Commission, but these are the ones that the event data service have been able to collect so far. Uh, I think at the end of the, this webinar, there will be a section where we discuss what the next steps that we have to do naturally to improve that and get a better picture. Uh, next slide. The last case that I want to show and talk about is about researchers. Uh, well, researchers would like to know how data is accessed and administrators would like to know whether uh, data from a specific researcher is getting some traction. In the PID world, we are using ORCIDs to identify researchers and using a variety of methods we have include ORCIDs IDs in, to the event data. And ORCIDs are connected to data sets. Again, these are in place connected to use citations. We have two degrees of separation. But with event data, now you can ask questions such as how many citations are assigned to my work? Next slide. And in that query, they will give you a response like this. We have this researcher, his name is David Jimenez. He's a researcher working in molecular simulation. And with a single uh, call to the event data API, you can obtain all the citations and users accounts and all the, all the resources linked to his ORCID ID. So these are the three complex use case that I want to show today, data centers, funders, and researchers. Uh, you might have noticed I didn't show many front-end interfaces thing, things, and it's because this is early work. Uh, I think the next section where Matt is coming in will show more about that. Uh, but we are really excited that uh, the API is out there and there is data already that everybody can start retrieving. Next slide. And I just want to mention that there is another webinar. Uh, this is by DataSite by the end of the month in which we will take more about details about uh, event data and the work data site is doing around this and, and then and the future steps that we have. So thank you. I can pass over to Marta. Yeah. Thanks, Christian. So the, uh, the APIs that Christian described for accessing both usage and citation data through the data site event data um, system are really useful for repositories and for repository networks and aggregators. Data One uh, is a network of, of repositories and repository networks, primarily based in the US, but kind of global in scope. It represents uh, currently a little over 40 different repository networks, um, mostly in the earth and environmental sciences and some in uh, social and, and economic sciences that relate to the earth and the environment. Um, we have about 850,000 data sets collectively across the different repositories that have a really heterogeneous landscape of um, systems and, and uh, software systems for delivering that data throughout uh, the world. So Data One provides a federation infrastructure that allows all of these repositories to interoperate and provides a common a API for both contributing and accessing data. We provide a harmonization layer um, so that different repositories can use metadata standards that are relevant to their own disciplines. 
and yet still be accessible through a common aggregated search framework. Um, so this screenshot that I have up on the screen is an example of the uh, search being done in the data one search interface. And uh, it's been really, I think, great to be part of the make data count project because we've been able to uh, provide citation and usage metrics across this whole network of repositories. So whereas in the past, each one of these repositories might have needed to track um, and utilize that kind of information on their own. Now when data is accessible through multiple different aggregators or through replicated copies for backup and failover, all of those different uh, sources of data can be reporting about their citations and about their usage. And that comes together so that data providers can get a more complete picture of how their data is being used. Um, so this search interface shows a, um, a search that we've done for a particular data set, in this case from the Arctic Data Center, which is a data center that I operate um, at UCSB, and uh, by a, a researcher named Heijo Eichen. And uh, you see a bunch of uh, data sets that are part of their work. And in the little pills at the bottom of each of the search records, you can see that you know, some of these data sets have been uh, cited. That's the little quote marks. Some of them have been downloaded two, two and a half thousand times for the first one. And then some of them have been viewed in different repositories. And so what you'll see is that it's you know, really interesting. Um, there's a huge amount of variability in how much different data sets are, are cited and, and accessed. Um, but I think it's, it's something that's probably very valuable to the individual researchers that are contributing data. Um, it's also aggregated across all of the different uh, sources where this might happen. And so different repositories report at differential rates back to uh, data one. Um, this also, you know, until the event data service, um, this reporting only really happened within the data one network. And now when data is aggregated by other groups, or for example, it might be accessed through data site search or other places, um, those events can get reported and aggregated as well. So we get a much more complete picture of the access to individual data sets from all of the different places where it's accessible. So next slide, Rishi. So if you drill into that data set that um, is being displayed, that was that first one by Eichen. I mean, you see that we display that same number of um, citations, downloads, and views on the, um, in the sort of buttons that are on the first uh, slide there. And then if you click on each of those buttons, you get a, a time series that shows uh, a more granular view of how often those data sets have been uh, cited, downloaded, and viewed. So Rushi, can you click the next slide and we'll look at first at, uh, at downloads. And so this slide shows that we basically have a, a detailed uh, time slider from across multiple years of monthly data showing people that there's, you know, kind of a time series that um, the data, data set access is, is quite variable um, from month to month. Some months there's very little access and then other months it spikes up uh, quite high. And so people might be able to correlate this with events that are important to them. Maybe this particular month was the month that they presented uh, their work at a conference or that a paper came out or something like that. So getting this time series level uh, resolution on the data, I think is really valuable to researchers. Um, next slide, Rishi. We can also do that same type of time series view for the number of times the data set has been viewed. So this represents um, the number of times that somebody has looked at the metadata record, either through the web or the access to the metadata record. Um, it's part of what the counter code of practice standardizes. So we, we have um, sort of put together a set of recommendations for how people look at um, what we call requests in counter parlance, which means accessing part of a data set, and investigations, which means that they access uh, part of that data set um, and or the metadata associated with that data set. And so these things get standardized in a way that they're comparable across what data site is displaying or data one is displaying or maybe is a node of this displaying. So Rushi, the next slide. And the, the, the final uh, thing that we're showing is the citations. In this case, uh, there's been one citation for this particular data set. It was a citation um, in this particular geoscience journal, which is something on the next slide, Rishi. Um, so this JGR Oceans uh, data set. So somebody can easily go from the data set to the particular science that used that data and find those direct linkages in a way that's, that's useful to the science community. 
So all of that is um, part of the sort of infrastructure that we made available for a while through Make Data Count. Um, it's, it's uh, I think, really only enabled because of the aggregation API that's available at the data site event data. And, uh, and I think it'll be a tremendous boon for all repositories and aggregators like Data One. Um, in addition to providing sort of direct information back to the researchers about their individual data sets, we also thought that it was really important to provide aggregated information to various groups about their collections of data sets. And so we've been working with, with DataSite on how to build these aggregated APIs and use them in ways that we can present information back to, say, whole repositories about how their whole collection is behaving, or maybe to a funder about how all of their funded data sets. So I'm going to go through and show a couple of uses of the aggregation API that Christian showed and kind of uh, illustrate how we're going to be using that within the Data One framework uh, for members of our network. So next slide, Rishi. The first set of aggregations is for uh, data repositories. Um, within Data One, each of the, the data repositories or, or networks um, has a profile page. And that profile page provides a lot of information about that repository. Um, we can also, in addition to a number of other metrics about the, the content and collection, we can provide a view that shows the number and, and content of all the citations across all of their data sets. And this is enabled by that same direct API query that Christian showed earlier for basically asking for all the citations associated with a particular uh, data center. Within data one, um, you'll notice that there are only eight citations on this particular uh, slide. The Arctic Data Center has uh, over 5,000 data sets, and those have been cited many, many times in articles across uh, the scientific literature. Um, so this is a really incomplete view of what is being just actually cited in the world. And that's something that will come up to later is that we really need to encourage publishers and repositories and others that hold this kind of citation data to make sure it gets published in along with the, uh, the other information about uh, the DOIs. And so publishers and repositories, I think, really could be um, doing a lot to try to provide this information to the centralized services like the Crossref and data site event data service. All right, the next slide, Rishi. So in addition to um, aggregating the citations, we can also provide aggregated views of the uh, aggregated counts of the numbers of views of data sets. And here you can see for the Arctic Data Center, we've had about 484,000 uh, views of all of our data sets over time. Um, these include views that happened at the Arctic Data Center, but they also include views that might have occurred through Data One's search interface or possibly through other search interfaces where data are aggregated or replicated. Um, so it's really important to get that aggregated view, especially in a network like Data One where we're we're replicating data through multiple different uh, systems. Thanks, Rishi. Um, the downloads, the same sort of picture. We have a very large number of, uh, of downloads, about 16 million downloads of the, of the data sets or partial downloads of the data sets over time. Um, in general, the, the downloads and views that we're displaying for these at the aggregated level um, can, can get quite high. And you can see there are some spikes in here. Um, I think there's still definitely some, some examination that needs to be done for some of the historical uh, download data. We've reported downloads historically from a large number of different uh, sources for the Arctic Data Center over time. And uh, the counter specification that we're following provides a specific set of rules about how to filter out web bots, spiders, and other sort of accesses that we don't consider part of the scientific uh, access of the data set. And yet still, I think some of those could be slipping through. Um, we've been, we've provided a standardized list of, of user agents and, and other uh, filter sort of criteria so that everybody that's reporting reports comparably. Um, but I think as a community, we would probably need to evolve that list so that we can find um, all the other sources of, of potentially non-scientific access to the, to the data. Um, that particular bar in the in 2015 makes me think that maybe we have a, an issue there. But okay, so it's really important to standardize, and so right now we're reporting what 
is is uh, the standard number according to the counter uh, the counter spec, but we still work as a community to to work on that. And then the next slide, Rishi. In addition to aggregating against uh, or for repositories, we can also look at all the data sets that are associated with a particular researcher. On that data one, we frequently have researchers that work not with one repository, but with multiple. So they might have done a deposit to the Dryad system with data associated with a particular paper. They might have had to deposit a, a larger set of data to the Arctic Data Center as part of their funding for an NSF program or something like that. Or they might have deposited something in, in, in one of the other uh, repository member nodes within data one, like Ecodemo for, for oceanographic data or maybe the environmental data initiative. So we'll want to uh, make sure that we can display all the data associated with each of those, those researchers, regardless of where it's housed. Rishi, next slide. So this shows uh, the same sort of information that we're showing for repositories, but instead aggregated for a particular user, in this case, Jeanette Clark, who's, uh, who's at Enthes and has worked on a lot of different data sets um, for, for synthesis science projects for, for NCs. Um, you can see it displays her ORCID there. So we're using ORCID as the filter for pulling out the data sets that are of, of interest. And we've, we look for all of the data sets that are associated with her user account. Um, one of the interesting things about this kind of an aggregation is it's actually pretty hard to do still because we, we have a lot of ambiguity about who the creators are on particular data sets. So we oftentimes have a name or sometimes a first initial of a name and many, many historical metadata records in the repository infrastructure that we see um, don't have anything more than that. Um, so getting those ORCIDs linked into the metadata records is really important for us to be able to disambiguate uh, the users and be able to do these kinds of aggregations across, um, across repositories. And I think most repositories are now working in that direction. And I think we're, we're looking forward to the future where we can have a more complete representation for each of the, the people. In this case, we're showing downloads for, for Jeanette's work, um, 36 and a half thousand downloads of her, her data sets over time. Okay, next slide, Rasheen. So overall, we're reporting these kinds of aggregations for repositories and for researchers right now. Um, we've built our infrastructure to be flexible enough to also report other types of aggregations. Um, we'll be doing it for, for individual research projects, for groups and labs um, of people that are interested in, in organizing their own data locally, um, for, for grants and awards, for funding programs and for funders, and for other types of aggregations and collections that are useful to the community. So we're looking forward to providing all that um, as a set of services from data one and in the near future. Okay, thanks. Next slide. Thanks so much, Matt and Christian, for going through all that. Um, I'm sure we just gave you guys a lot of information with a lot of questions. We've seen some of them come in. Um, you can use the chat function or the Q&A function and start typing those in, and we'll get there in a second with answering them. But we wanted to talk a little bit about where we're headed. So, of course, we've done all this work to standardize, to display it, to do aggregations, but what do we actually need to do now? Next slide. So one of the big ones that we've been thinking about is that we have to make it implementation easier. We've been talking, we did put out a survey. We got 89 responses from repositories asking, do you know about the counter code of practice? A little less than half said they did know. And then when we went and explained it through the survey, and that was through the RDA data usage metrics working group, we said, would you standardize and would you get involved? And 70% said, interested, but I don't have the resources. And so a big focus that we need to be thinking about is how do we make this all easier? We have the infrastructure, it's open and it's there, but how can we get more repositories to participate as well as publishers and others that we're about to jump through? Next slide. So one of the issues is one that I raised earlier is that um, aggregators like Data One need to be consistent in how they report back to the data producers and to other groups about um, the data sets and data set accesses that they have. Um, right now, I think a lot of the data sets that move to aggregators oftentimes get um, reported separately um, for accesses for that aggregator um, from where the original repository was or for 
for where maybe a replica of the data are. And so this service provides the ability for all these different groups to report back to event data and for all the data producers and others to get aggregated information across all those different places where people can access data. The data one has found this very valuable and I think other aggregators would as well. And the data producers will really appreciate it um, if they get a complete picture of accesses when, they're, when their data is being distributed in the open world. Next slide. So we've talked a lot um, about this infrastructure for eventual data metrics, but we don't think that we have data metrics and we also don't think that we have credit for data. We have just built the infrastructure to get us there. And what we really need to do is we need to work with the bibliometrics community. And we're lucky enough to have a representative on our advisory board uh, who is deeply involved in this community, thanks to Rodrigo Costas. Uh, but we know that we really need to get the bibliometricians to start looking at these numbers that we're gathering. We know that they have to be open and it needs to be in this open framework that is event data so that they have enough to study. But we want to stress that we need to all work as a community with those bibliometricians to figure out what metrics even make sense for data, what the numbers represent for views and downloads, um, and, add, and to get there, we just need people to get involved in this effort. In addition, in order to get people uh, interested in understanding those, those statistics that Danielle was talking about, I think we need to show the benefits of contributing to the central event data framework. Um, right now, there are, uh, you know, probably between Dataverse and Data One and Dryad and the data site, there's, there's probably hundreds of repositories contributing, but there are many thousands more uh, that are not yet part of the network. And so these benefits of being able to aggregate statistics and report in a very consistent way uh, would accrue to all, all people that are running data repository infrastructure and to publishers and others that have um, interest in the linkages between data sets and publications. And so we need to really spread the word about how important it is to try to share this information across the whole community. We also need a clear story for non-DOIs. So we've been focused this project on data site DOIs and that's how we were able to develop this framework. But we know that a whole bunch of data out there is um, the life sciences and human sciences that are using accession numbers and other non-DOIs uh, identifiers. So there's a couple of examples here. And we began talking with them, but we really need to figure out which resources we're going to utilize, things like identifiers.org, to actually get them into this framework and start being able to standardize and get these statistics back for these repositories. We know that if we just focus on general repositories or repositories that use DOIs, we're not going to have this centralized success that we're looking for. In order to have that success, we also need uh, both publishers and prioritize, uh, sorry, publishers and repositories to uh, sort of make it an important thing for them to prioritize exposing their citation data. Um, this graphic here that you see on the screen is a part of the survey that we did uh, to, to various groups, um, including publishers, asking whether or not they see value in correctly indexing uh, data citations. Interestingly, you know, this, this question in the survey was tweeted by over 40 different publishers, um, basically saying that, yes, you know, they, they thought it was important as expressed by the fact that they distributed the survey all over the place, but only four of them filled it out. All four of them thought it was really important for us to correctly index them, but um, we really need to get uh, both publishers and repositories to, to spend the time to build the infrastructure to report back whenever there is a data citation found either in their reference list or in the, the full text of their, of their uh, journal articles to report that back to event data and make it available to the, the rest of the community. I think the repositories can also do the same thing. Many repositories spend a lot of time manually tracking their, their citations and figuring out who's using their data in different ways. And those could also be reported. So it can come from either side of the link, uh, the data side or the, or the journal article side. So that's kind of the steps forward that we we're aspiring to take and that's our future roadmap. Um, and that's kind of a call to action to the community in many ways that we're gonna be stressing. 
Uh, but we also want to talk about how we can get really excited about those who are making data count. Um, and so there's some logos here of those who have implemented. Um, and of course, Dryad, when Dryad releases on the CDL technology in the next couple of months. Um, but we want to be really excited about we make data count. So next slide. How can we make data count? So if you're a repository or you're at an institution that uses repository framework, you're thinking, how can we actually get this involved? There's three steps. And we want to hear from the community as well. If this is something that you'd be interested in displaying, saying something like we make data count or something of that form. We have now the Data One Network, Dryad, Zenodo, um, Dataverse who have put this in. And we want to hear from more repositories what you'd be interested in displaying about saying that you're doing this. But the three major steps are, again, looking at that diagram is processing the logs against Dakota practice, so it's actually comparable. Views at one repository can be compared to views at a different one. They're submitting those to our central infrastructure, which is event data, so that we can do aggregations and have transparent numbers to actually start building metrics, and then displaying it back, so showing the views, the downloads, the citations, aggregations um, within your user interface so that researchers, funders, institutions, et cetera, can all actually use this. And that's what the three parts of making data count. Next slide. So with that, we wanted to open it up for questions. Um, we can give it a sec for people to write some more in. And while you do that, I will kick off with the first question that we got. Um, so from Deba, citation is a readily understandable concept, but where can I find the definition of usage? Matt, do you want to take that? Sure. So usage is kind of an aggregate um, concept that we've been using for uh, to represent the, the ideas behind views and downloads that are frequently displayed on different repository sites. Um, so the definition for different types of usage, in particular, uh, the terms investigations and requests comes from the counter code of practice for research data uh, that we proposed. Um, we use uh, uh, investigations and requests as sort of the, the collection framework. And then from that, we, we relate those to what we call views and downloads. So downloads correspond to requests within the, in the counter code of practice, and views correspond to the investigations that you find that don't include the, the, uh, the direct download requests. So views basically represent metadata um, accesses. So this is all uh, detailed in the counter code of practice for research data. Um, there's some continued discussion about how these are defined and whether it's right. And I think we're open to a, a community conversation about another version of the counter code of practice, if that makes sense, to encounter more nuances as we add more groups to the, to the implementation list. And if we find things that need to be represented, we can in include more statistics um, that might need to be uh, standardized. Thanks, Matt. So the next question is a little bit of a, a tricky one here. So, Matt or Christian, whoever wants to answer. So if data set A that has been cited by a Crossref publication references data set B, can I get to the citation by querying data set B? So, okay, I'm reading that one. Uh... Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, practically you can you can query. Uh, you will get uh, in the in event data you can query by either of the two um, uh, points of the and nodes of the relationship, either the one cited or the one cited by. In essence, so you can query for either of those two. Yeah. Now we're gonna. No. Yeah, I was just saying, and I, and I think the other part of that question was about it's a data set that references another data set. And so that does work as well. It doesn't have to be a, yeah. a journal publication referencing a data set. It can be I, I, exactly. data set citing it or some other resource. So as long as both ends have a DOI right now, um, you, can, you can query for the two of them. And they, of course, have to have been reported to event data to find it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Next question. I think there was a quick mention at the beginning about using the event data service to help repository researchers, et cetera, attract mentions of data on social media and elsewhere on the internet. What are the plans and timelines for this? Christian, you want to answer? Yeah, so event data in the very beginning was about uh, uh, collecting events about uh, social, um, social media uh, mentions. Um, that is partially implemented in the cross website. Data site uh, is still looking to implement that for the uh, data sets. And also, at the moment, we don't have uh, a plan to, to, put, to put it up there. Actually, we just need to push the data because the data can be collected. We just need to start uh, pushing it. Um, we are actually interested to know what's the interest in the community of this. So, depending on that, we will start moving along that. The, those the, the data into the main API. So yeah, there, there are plans of the, uh, about that, but we have not been rolling out those things, but it's good that there is interest. So we, I can pass that information along to say like, maybe we can speed out of that process. Thanks, and following on a similar question about event data, where can we find resources on actually being able to pull queries and utilize the current infrastructure of event data, not necessarily as a repository, but to see that information that's in there. Yeah, so, so Pat, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Christian. Well, I mean, about getting information about how to use the API uh, and practically all the information is the, the, site, the support website. We have a complete guide of, and I'm just posting out there in the chat box of how to query the API and how to query to actually get usage citations. Yeah. Great, and it looks like you also just added a link here and we can yeah. spin around with the slides and webinar. Uh, we just got another question. How come a data set can have more downloads than views? Don't you have to view metadata to decide to download or not to download? Matt. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, so there can be two reasons why a data set might have more downloads than views. Um, one is that not all repositories at which a data set might be viewed are reporting all of their views of downloads. So we can get incomplete reporting um, and that can lead to, to a difference. So some repositories are tracking downloads but not tracking views. So you might see, for example, they have a lot of downloads of their data sets but very few views. Um, oftentimes those few views come because an aggregator like data one is reporting views, but the main repository at which the, um, at which the data set is housed is not reporting views, they're only reporting downloads. And so because of that, you might have a couple hundred views through the data one portal, and you might have a few thousand downloads directly through the, through the data portal that, that the data site, that the data set is housed at. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is that we support tracking of accesses to data sets through programmatic means. And so many researchers, once they discover a data set, um, or if they already have the identifier for a data set from an article, they can access a data set programmatically and, and say use an R script or a, or a Python script or something else or a curl command to access um, many, many different portions of the data set. And so that can pretty massively increase the download count when they're programmatically building scripts that, that access large parts of a data repository uh, infrastructure. Um, so there are mechanisms for accessing the data that wouldn't necessarily have to uh, generate views when you're doing so. So both of those can, can result in a, in a kind of a weird flipped set of statistics like that. So somewhat following on to that, um, Maggie's just asked, some repositories separate counts of metadata views and actual visualizations of data contents. How should this be treated according to the code of practice? So the code of practice defines uh, two, two main concepts, investigations and requests. Um, a request is anytime somebody accesses all or part of the actual contents of a data set, meaning what, what as the researcher that published the data set would have considered to be the main um, the main content of the data sets. For, so for most data, this means the actual rows or, or uh, of data that are in a data table or the, the imagery that's in, say, a geospatial data set. Um, if somebody is accessing um, a visualization of that data set, um, that is more of what we would call an investigation and would be counted in the views. Of course, many visualizations that are dynamically generated mean that somebody has to access the data in order to generate the 
the, the graph that somebody then looks at and views. So sometimes through some interfaces, um, you know, generating a view of a landing page that shows a preview might actually also access the data. I think the differentiation we're trying to make is that when somebody actually transfers the data to their computer in some, um, in the sort of original way, that counts as a, as a request. Uh, there is a, a definitely some gray area here. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that we, we struggled with this a little bit in, in data one, and I think other groups have struggled with how exactly to differentiate those things. Um, for me, the, the di main difference has been, it becomes a request if and only if they access a portion of the actual content of the data set. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to, to add to that. Christian, I think you guys probably had similar issues, probably trying to figure out where the dividing line is, right? I don't think so. Uh, well, I mean, we, we are, uh, uh, I think data site is uh, uh, working in, 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 actually we must look at views uh, for some DOIs, uh, for, for, for DOIs, we don't look at downloads because we don't have access to that. Uh, and yeah, we have been struggling a little bit what, uh, with uh, how to separate those ones. But yeah, we're still discussing that. So we got an, another from Maggie here. Some researchers and data producers find it important to differentiate, others don't. Maybe domain-specific practices will crystallize out over time. Kind of a comment there. I don't know, Matt, did you have some, anything to add on that? No, I think that's, I think it's, it's absolutely true that, that there will be, I think, uh, differences among disciplines and how they view um, the differences between accessing content and just visualizing um, something about the record. Um, and it probably will change over time. Uh, it's one of the nice things about the code of practice being a community standard is that as these community standards evolve, we can update it and, and hopefully come to some, uh, some long-term agreement about how we do this in a way that's comparable across repositories. Definitely. So Daniel's trying to throw another early curveball to us again. So paper A cites data set B that references data set C. Can I get to paper A from data set C? Yeah, so there, there are many queries that you can make in even data. Uh, and actually the one about the funder uh, ID that I showed earlier is practically this same example with the difference that it's not paper A, but funder A. And the relationship is between the data set B and B citing this funder A. So you can get uh, the funder, the data set, and the cited paper, so in the trio on that relationship. So it is possible um, uh, to get actually that in that, in that specific case. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put a, uh, an addition to this that um, I think this is a really important concept. It's, it's basically a concept of, of transitive credit. Um, Dan Katz has written a a couple of great papers and blog posts about how important it is for us to track the relationships among data sets so that when a paper cites a data set and that in turn depends upon and utilizes other data sets or other software, um, we can sort of shift some of that credit to those, those foundational pieces of work. Um, so what's interesting is that there's a different set of relationships between say a paper citing a data set and a data set say incorporating another data set. So the data site event data uh, reporting infrastructure includes different types of um, different types of uh, relationships that can be quantified. So cited, you know, sites or is cited by is one of the relationships, but there's also, you know, was derived from, um, is a revision of, is a different version of. So there's all these different relationships that can be specified between the objects in the in the links, and we have a certain a, a set of those that we basically are calling citations including in these statistics uh, i think that's another area where we could have a community conversation about what's the appropriate set of relationships should, that should be counted or not counted in these kinds of transitive credit graphs um, that are there and somebody asked if i could post a reference to that study and i i can't it will take me a minute to uh track down the citation but i have it so we just got a, another question can you as a researcher or a repository trick the system, e.g. generate lots of downloads to boost your stats? 
I can kick that off by saying that that's a lot of why we're working on this in the first place. So we know that there are a bunch of ways that people can game stats. We are not going to fix that outright. There are many issues that we have with statistics and that we really have with articles and that we're really trying to avoid that uh, here in the data world, but some of them are just you know, the community and, and how people are gonna, what people are gonna do, they're always gonna find a way to game the system. But one thing we know is that people are, uh, there are ways that we're filtering out for that. And so we're actually looking at how many times people are clicking within a minute, how many times people are accessing the same data set um, from the same area, looking at which way the requests are coming in, filtering out bots and things like that. Uh, but we do know that this is something uh, that people are always gonna try and do. I don't know if Matt wants to build on that or Christian. Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. Um, there, there are many ways of gaming the system. This is one of the reasons why we think the next, one of the next steps is to have the metrics community members really participate in figuring out how to evaluate these. One of the real challenges with data sets is that there's no universal definition of what is a, what constitutes a data set. Um, some people will lump together years or possibly even decades of data across thousands of different sensors into a single data set. And other people might split that data set into one data set per year or one per month or one per week. And depending upon how you do it, it really changes the way in which your counts get reflected um, across the system. And so it is, it is really important for us to start thinking about do, do counts really represent you know, something meaningful? Um, we, we added into the counter code of practice a metric for data volume being downloaded as well as the counts. So you might get a better sense of what percentage of a data set is being downloaded as opposed to whether or not how many times a portion of it's being downloaded. There's still, I think, a lot of work that we have to do as a community to, to come up with something meaningful here. So. Great, so uh, we're just closing out here. I wanted to give a last second to see if anyone had any last questions uh, while anyone could be typing that. Um, I wanna mention that we've talked about how this was a two year Sloan grant. And for anyone who's been following the dates, um, we're just closing out this phase of the project. And we're really excited that DataSite is gonna be um, responsible for the infrastructure that's doing this and Data One and CDL are committed to continuing to work on this. The repositories who have implemented have said the same. Um, and we're, we really plan on carrying this all forward. And so while we've been advertising that it was this grant project, uh, we're actually just gonna be continuing onwards with this. We think it's really essential for the community and we'll be carrying it through the RDA Data Usage Metrics Working Group um, and just through continued communications through each of our organizational channels and the Make Data Count website and Twitter. Uh, we have a mailing list on the makedatacount.org site if you wanna join that way and we also post everything on Twitter often. My email address is on here. Please reach me if you want to talk about implementation or if you have further questions. And give you a second here, it looks like we don't have any others, but we will follow up anytime and we will tweet, oh, we will tweet out, uh, someone asked, makedatacount.org will be continued, yes. So documentation is, of course, at the data site, site as well because event data, but the makedatacount.org mirrors all of that information and points to the right places, such as where to find everything on data one. Um, and this will be continued um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we really care about keeping this going. And any last? Great, so we're gonna, we'll put out on Twitter, uh, if you follow us, the uh, recording and the link uh, and the um, slide deck, they'll be posted on the website under presentations, which is under resources. Um, and if you have any questions, please do let us know. Otherwise, I wanna thank uh, Christian and Rushi and Matt and Amber and everyone who was able to join. Your questions were awesome and it was a really great discussion. So thanks. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.